Good afternoon and welcome to the SCR webinar, Service Animals and Emotional Support Animals Clearing the Confusion. During the course of the webinar, you can enter your questions into the questions box located on the webinar task bar. We will leave time at the end of the webinar to answer any questions. Our presenter today is Cynthia DeLuca. Cynthia has sold thousands of properties, managed over 135 realtors, and educated tens of thousands of real estate professionals. After selling her real estate brokerage, Cynthia decided to focus her career on helping other realtors reach a higher potential. During her 13 years as a broker and owner, Cynthia built and managed multiple departments, including residential resales, new construction, and builder representation, property management, commercial, and business opportunities. Cynthia's love of real estate goes beyond her professional career. Cynthia purchased her first rental property in 1999, and as the saying goes, the rest is history. She now has a portfolio of rentals she manages with her husband. Cynthia is the author of The High Heels Landlord and Filler Up, available on Amazon. So thank you for joining us today, Cynthia, and I turn the presentation over to you. Okay, thank you, and good afternoon to everybody. I'm here to guide you through the service animals and the emotional support animals confusion. So a lot of times I get people that ask questions of, aren't these the same thing? And they're not. A big part of the confusion comes because we have a lot of different industries uh, that have a lot of different rules. So we're going to talk today specifically about real estate and how this affects us. And it really, in my opinion, affects every realtor member because it doesn't matter if you're selling, if you're managing, if you have a commercial building, uh, these laws apply in various ways to each of us. So, you know, you might have a buyer that's looking to purchase in a condo association or a homeowners association. And if the association has rules that they can't have animals or they can't have certain types of animals, um, then people tend to say it's either a service animal or an emotional support animal. So we'll talk about that, kind of how to know the fakes. And then um, if you're renting property, of course, we have the same situation when it comes to rentals with tenants applying with animals if there's no pets allowed or no specifically dogs or large dogs allowed. So we're going to go through this. The first thing I want to comment about is that um, we have several different laws that apply that we kind of layer together. So I think of it like a totem pole. So when you look at a totem pole, if you look at the very top of the totem pole, at the very top of our totem pole is the American with Disabilities Act, ADA, and we're going to touch on that quite a bit. So ADA applies to all public places, all businesses, all buildings that are open to the public, everywhere that the public has the ability to go use and patronize. So because of that, ADA applies to pretty much everybody. It's at the top of our totem pole. Then when we come down from the totem pole is another federal law, so these are nationwide, and that's the Fair Housing Act. Now the Fair Housing Act differs under ADA um, because the Fair Housing Act only applies when it comes to housing. So it applies to landlords, it applies to sellers, and it applies to uh, real estate professionals and brokerages, um, which prohibit all of, all of those entities from uh, not offering services or properties available uh, due to any of the protections in fair housing. So because it's specific to the real estate industry, it does defer under ADA, so it falls below ADA on the totem pole. After those federal laws, then we talk about, you know, uh, state laws then come into play, then you get local city ordinances and county ordinances, um, and then at the bottom of that totem pole are the homeowners associations and the condo associations. The challenge we sometimes have is that they think they're at the top of the totem pole, and that can be a challenge because they're, they're unaware of the laws or they just don't care or don't know. So anyways, um, we always want to make sure we understand these are federal mandated laws. And again, because ADA is the, we're going to start with ADA. So um, the American with Disabilities Act, as I mentioned, is in place for a lot of things. And it's really there to help people that have a, a physical or any type of disability um, that refers to them going out 
in the public and using areas that patronize the public. So the American with Disabilities Act, we have a lot of things that apply under ADA. Um, this law became effective in 1990. It was passed and, and placed into law. And so anytime we have a building that's built after uh, March of 1991, uh, then you'll see that if there's more than one story in the building, you have to have an elevator. Uh, it's why we have handicapped parking spaces when we go to grocery stores, restaurants, and shopping centers. Um, there are gas pumps. Uh, there's been quite a few updates with ADA, and, and one of the more recent ones was the gas pumps. Uh, in many states, you know, there's self-service gas available. And so for someone with a physical disability to pull up and have to get out of their vehicle, if you think about uh, them being in a wheelchair or anything like that, it really changes um, the ability for them to, to do those easy functions. So they have the ability, next time you go to get gas, uh, take a look, and there'll be either a phone number listed on the gas pump where they can call an employee and the employee can come out and help them pump gas at no additional cost, or they um, have like a push button or something like that again where they can get assistance. So the idea of the American with Disabilities Act is it requires businesses, um, nonprofit organizations, government agencies, and basically anybody that provides goods and services to the public uh, to make what's called reasonable modifications in their uh, policies, in their business practices or anything like that. So specifically for us, what we're gonna talk about are the service animals. So service animals under the American with Disabilities Act, federal law, is defined as a dog that has been individually trained to do work or perform tasks for an individual with a disability. And the task performed by the dog must be directly related to the person's disability. So, uh, a service animal is unique in the sense that it has been trained. Now, interestingly enough, the American with Disabilities Act does not require the training to be done by a licensed or certified trainer. Um, there is no requirement for the uh, for the uh, animal to have a registration or a card or anything like that that kind of shows uh, what they you know that they are truly a service animal um, and uh, so there's no certification either the reason why there's no certification or database that would really help us uh, be able to look up who really does have a service animal is because if they ask people with a service animal to register in a database the challenge with that is um, they're asking people with a disability specifically to register, and that in itself is basically discriminating against somebody with a disability. So we don't see things like that. That's not ever going to happen. Um, and also notice the service animals defined as a dog. So federal law looks at service animals as dogs only. They made that modification back in 2011. Uh, so dogs are the only animals that are recognized under federal law. Now, sometimes there's state laws. Sometimes there's local, county, and city laws as well. Uh, so we have to be mindful of those. But under the federal requirements, there's nothing um, that states it's anything other than a dog. So the animal does not have to be professionally trained. It can be self-trained. Um, but when you consider the training aspect of that, that can be very challenging because if the person is disabled, let's say they're in a wheelchair or it's like a seeing eye dog because the person is blind, it, the reason why they need the animal is because they need assistance. And so it makes it a little bit more difficult for them to uh, to train them. So the um, the animals, and speaking of training, when an animal is in training and is not actively in service for someone with a disability, it is not protected under federal laws. So the animal has to be in service working for that individual who has the disability doing whatever task it is that they're trained to do. So if they're retired or if they're in training to become a service animal, they do not have any protection under federal laws. So um, interestingly enough, when you think about um, these animals and the tasks that they can perform. So as I mentioned, it could be a seeing eye dog. It could be a dog that's trained to go retrieve items and bring it back to their uh, handler is what they call the people that own them or that have the disability that, uh, that assist that you know that the dog assists for uh, so they could maybe in a grocery store they go get items off a shelf bring it back put it in the person's wheelchair or buggy or whatnot that they have um, so you know the idea of the service animals that they are trained to take that specific action when needed to assist the person with the disability 
Now I had somebody who thought they were smart and said to me, well, I, my dog is very, very trained. My dog goes to the refrigerator and gets me a beer. Okay, so in the service animal, the dog must be trained to take this specific action when needed to assist the person with a disability. Hey, Cynthia, um, yeah. sorry to interrupt. Something just happened. Um, can you go back to the last slide, slide I, and start again? Yep, I actually noticed when it muted, so I stopped talking. Oh, <laughs> so yeah, yeah, so, so we didn't miss anything, so. Um, so the service animal, specifically that dog that is trained to take action, whether it's for someone um, who has a specific disability, um, whatever that task is, if it assists them with the disability. So there's a couple of things that need to happen there. One, the person has to have a disability. And then two, the dog has to be trained to take action for whatever this is that they've been trained to do. So when the dog is trained to take that specific action when needed to assist the person with a disability, I had someone say to me that their dog was trained to go to the refrigerator and retrieve a beer out of the refrigerator. Well, that's awesome that they trained their dog to do that and that is taking a specific action. However, that is not necessarily a disability uh, for them to go get a beer for them. <laughs> Might be a disability at some point, but it's not at this point. So it needs to be something to assist that person with the disability along there. So a couple of the things that I mentioned is only dogs are recognized under the American with Disabilities Act. And as I mentioned, there's no national registration database, nor are they recognized by the Department of Justice, any of those databases. So sometimes someone might come to you into your office and hand you a, um, a piece of paper that's printed out by an online website. They might give you a card. I've seen them, they look like driver's license uh, almost, and they have the dog information on it, or maybe the name of the handler and the name of the dog. And so the challenge is when they bring those in, uh, they might be legitimate. It doesn't mean that they're all fakes. However, a lot of them, uh, none of them, I should say, are recognized by the Department of Justice. Now, let me explain to you how the Department of Justice comes into this. So if someone violates the American with Disabilities Act, the Department of Justice, who are the federal attorneys, basically, they work for the federal government, they prosecute any violations under the American with Disabilities Act. So the Department of Justice is the one really that overall sees um, these, these claims and, and prosecutes them. And so they do not recognize any of these national registration databases. So if someone comes into my office and hands me a card and says, I have a service animal. Well, that doesn't necessarily mean they do or they don't just because they handed me a card. So I am not going to really even acknowledge that or pay attention to it and go, great, that's fine, but I need to ask you a couple of questions. Now, under the American with Disabilities Act, they allow us to ask two specific questions. And these questions, I'm going to give you a resource at the end of the webinar to get all this if you don't want to write it down right now or take a picture of the screen. But the two specific questions under the American with Disabilities Act are, is the dog a service animal required because of a disability? So in other words, is a service animal required because of a disability? So the dog, which is a service animal, is it required because of a disability? That's either a yes or no question. They either have the disability or they don't. Now I wanna be clear here, you are not allowed at all to ask them about the disability. You are not allowed to ask them at all about the person's disability or the nature of what happened. Now, if it's obvious, right, they might be in a wheelchair, sometimes that's obvious. So the second question then is, let's say they say, yes, the dog is required because of a disability. So the second question is what work or task has the dog been trained to perform? So that is more of an open-ended question where they're gonna have to explain what the dog is trained to do. So maybe the dog retrieves items for them. Sometimes the disability is not visible. So uh, sometimes there's people who have seizures or uh, di severe diabetics. And so those dogs are trained to sense the onset of let's say a seizure, or if the person has a seizure, they're trained to put the person in a position that is the safest for them, and then even leave them to go get other help by other humans. Um, so, you know, it's not always obvious when you look at the person if they have a disability or they don't. So these are the two specific questions you're gonna ask. Is the dog a service animal required because of a disability? And what worker task has the dog been trained to perform? So 
again, we're not allowed to request under ADA any documentation for the dog. Now, I don't want to confuse you because when we get to service animals uh, under the Fair Housing Act, they do allow us to ask for documentation. But sometimes you hear people say, like, uh, for instance, the airlines industry, they'll say, oh, well, the flight attendants can't even ask for any documentation. Well, that's actually true under the American with Disabilities Act. But because we have fair housing, it gives us a little bit different of an exemption that we have the right uh, to ask. So we'll get to that. So we're not gonna ask the dog to perform whatever they're trained to do. You're not allowed to do that either. So if they say, well, the dog's trained to retrieve items for me, you can't say, well, show me because I, I need to see that the dog actually is trained for that. You cannot do that. So you want to make sure that it's clear. Um, you're just asking the question and they're answering to you and, um, and that's that. So again, we do not want to ask the handler to make the dog perform the task and you cannot ask for paperwork under ADA, um, but we are going to get to that. So what happens if they answer these questions properly and it is a service animal? Well, at that point, that's when the reasonable modification kicks in. And so let's say that we have a no pets policy. Well, now we have to go and adjust that policy and allow the service animal because um, the, um, that's the reasonable modification we have to make because the service animal is protected under federal law. So think of it very similar to like a person with a wheelchair. If a person with a wheelchair went into a restaurant, the restaurant could not look at them and say, sorry, we can't serve you. You have to leave because you have a wheelchair. So they treat the service animal very similar. It's a tool, an assistance tool used to assist the person with a disability. So because of that, you really have to act like the dog does not exist and the dog is not there at all. Now, sometimes question comes up, um, some cities have ordinances that prohibit certain breeds or certain types of dogs that is not allowed under ADA. So again, when you think back to our totem pole, you've got at the very top of the totem pole, ADA, the federal law. So it's going to supersede or have control over any laws underneath it on that totem pole, including city ordinances. So when, if there is a city or a county or an HOA or any of those that do not allow certain breeds, certain sizes or anything like that of dogs, ADA says, we don't care what your rules are, we are going to supersede them. So they have to allow the dog. Now this extends to all pieces and parts of the housing piece for us. So in other words, it extends to everything. It's the insurance company, it's the landlord, it's the HOA, it's all facets of the property have to modify their rules to allow the animal because it is uh, covered under the American with Disabilities Act. So you can still, if you ask all of your, let's say tenants, if you're a property manager, if you ask all of your tenants to provide you with documentation that their dogs have current vaccines, you can ask for that for the service animal as well. What you cannot do is only ask the service animal. So in other words, you have to treat all the same, not just the person with the disability, who happens to have the service animal any different. You don't wanna ask them and not ask everybody else. Um, if your city or counties require all dogs to be licensed and registered, like through the vet, when you go there uh, and have the, have the dogs uh, have their shots and everything you know updated then yes then the service animal also has to be registered and whatnot it's just not allowed to be registered separately just because it's a service animal so um in those instances again the handler is really the one that's in charge of the animal so they're the ones that have to you know feed it control it all of that stuff the animal does not have to be on a leash um, as long as they have some type of control over the animal. So it could be voice control. You know, and think about it, if you're in the grocery store and there's someone in the grocery store with a service animal and they cannot physically go get whatever it is that they need off of the shelf, um, but the dog can, if the dog was on a leash, it might prohibit the dog from the ability uh, to go gather the items. So they don't have to be on a leash as long as they are under some type of voice control or whatnot uh, from the handler. So if a service animal is being disrupted, because again, this is for all public life. So let's say you're in a restaurant and let's say someone has a service animal 
but the animal is growling, the animal is barking, the animal is defecating everywhere using the rest, you know, the bathroom, um, things like that, then the employees of the uh, business may ask that the animal be removed so the animal can leave. The difference is they're not allowed to ask the person with the disability to leave. Um, so just be very, very clear. The person with a disability is extremely protected. The animal is a tool to assist the person in the disability. Um, and so we don't wanna ask them to leave. So again, as I mentioned, the Department of Justice or the DOJ, they are the ones that um, put this into motion and uh, kind of oversee the American with Disabilities Act. And then they do any type of violations or concerns. They are the ones that uh, go and investigate and discipline that. Uh, one more thing on service animals, and then we're going to move on to the emotional support animals. With service animals, it is possible for someone to have more than one service animal. There is no limit to the amount of service animals they could have. So I personally have never seen it. However, uh, let's say that someone had a service animal that was a, um, maybe it was trained to be a seeing eye dog. And then at the same time, they had a second animal that was trained to go retrieve items and bring them back. So maybe you have two different animals that are trained for two totally different functions. Um, they, it is possible for them to have two different service animals under the same handler. So if they do come and they do have two service animals for some reason, again, I personally have never seen it, but it could happen. Um, don't automatically assume that they can't have those animals um, because again, maybe more than one is what they need to fulfill that duty. Okay. So that's ADA, that's every public facility, again, every place of operation, every business that anybody in the public has the ability to go to, uh, the service animal has the right to be there as well. So now let's talk about the Fair Housing Act. The Fair Housing Act is more specific for our industry because it relates to housing. So when we talk about selling properties, renting properties, uh, things like that, the Fair Housing Act covers seven protected classes federally. And in those seven protected classes, one of those is disability. And disability is, or handicap, is the specific thing that is under the protection with the Fair Housing Act. So we're not allowed to refuse to rent or sell housing because of any of the, uh, any of the disabilities or any of the reasons under fair housing. We're not allowed to refuse to negotiate for housing, make housing unavailable, uh, deny a dwelling, in other words, deny the tenant to be able to move into the property or same thing like with a homeowners association or whatnot. We're not allowed to set different terms, conditions or anything like that. So in other words, we cannot raise the rent. We can't charge a different fee. We can't do all that kind of stuff if the um, protection falls under fair housing. So we want to make sure that we're not um, violating the Fair Housing Act. So what you'll see is the Fair Housing Act, I just want to be clear on the screen, the Fair Housing Act typically is abbreviated as FHA-CT, so I just don't want you to get that confused with um, FHA financing, so it's the Fair Housing Act. So again, all of these, uh, the seven protected classes are covered, but the emotional support animals, or ESAs, specifically fall under disability, okay? And what it says um, in the Fair Housing Act is that persons with disabilities may request a reasonable accommodation. So again, very similar to ADA, which has the reasonable modification change, um, now a reasonable accommodation for any assistance animal. So they do call the animals under the Fair Housing Act assistance animals. But what this says is it includes an emotional support animal under both the Fair Housing Act and Section 504. Section 504 is the Rehabilitation Act, which kind of preceded the Fair Housing Act. Um, so both of those are very similar when it comes to the disability piece. So they look at all assistance animals under the Fair Housing Act, which includes emotional support animals. So what's the big difference with an emotional support animal? An emotional support animal is often used um, as a part of a medical treatment plan as therapy animals. They provide companionship, they relieve loneliness, and sometimes help with depression or anxiety. So we see this with PTSD, we see this with law enforcement officers who have um, 
travel to a, a, a scene that you know has really hurt them, damaged them emotionally, they have problems sleeping. Um, vets, you know, are a big a big one. So there's a lot of reasons, a lot of good reasons why emotional support animals really need to exist and why the protection is there federally under fair housing. Now the difference with the emotional support animal, there's a couple of differences, but one of the differences between the emotional support animal and the service animal is that the emotional support animal only has the protection under fair housing, which means their house or their, you know, their primary where they live. So basically it does not mean that they can take their emotional support animal with them to Walmart or to the grocery store or to the restaurant or anywhere else in public. The only animal that has the legal right to be in public is the service animal. And again, to qualify the service animal, we ask those two questions uh, that we started out with to verify are they a service animal? Um, is the dog a service animal required because of a disability? And what task has the animal been trained to perform? So when we talk about these assistance animals with emotions, emotional support animals, um, it's again, specific to the person with a disability, they can request this reasonable accommodation for any assistance animal, including this emotional support animal. So how they define the emotional support animal is that it's not a pet, it provides emotional support that alleviates one or more identified symptoms or effects of a person's disability. So again, going back to the disability, um, the person has to have a named disability. It does not mean that anybody can just go print a certificate off the internet and say that their animal is an emotional support animal and take them with them everywhere. So if you have not heard of the peacock that tried to fly in the plane, from uh, Newark to Los Angeles. You're welcome to look that up. There's videos of it on YouTube as well. Um, but um, the, that really brought emotional service animals to light. There's a lot of different types of animals, not just specific to dogs like service animals. Now, sometimes to clear the confusion, some people will say, well, I have a therapy animal or I have a comfort animal or whatnot. The only animals that are classified under federal laws are emotional support animals, and service animals. So sometimes what they talk about with these comfort uh, animals is they'll bring them to hospitals at, or they'll bring them to nursing homes and they will allow them to bring them inside and, and kind of spend a little bit of time with the, um, with the residents or with the patients and just kind of cheer up their spirits. And that's awesome. However, those animals are not protected under federal law. They don't have to allow them. So the hospital is giving them permission to bring the animal in, but there's no federal laws that make them or require them to allow that animal to come in. So the other big difference with the emotional support animal is that the animal is not required to be trained. And this is the problem when, you know, the big difference that we see is people take their emotional support animals on flights across country and then they bite somebody or they defecate in the aisle or, you know, they just don't behave because they're not required to be trained. If you've seen or spent time with a true service animal that is trained, they're very, very good dogs. They, you barely realize that they're even there because they're so well behaved. But with the emotional support animals or the ESAs, they're not required to be trained at all. So that's a big difference. It's really impossible for an animal to be a service animal and an emotional support animal at the same time. So sometimes um, people go online and they buy these vests and they put it over their dog. And on one side, it says service dog. And on the other side, it says emotional support animal. And to me, that's a dead giveaway that that is a fake because they cannot possibly be both. The big difference is a service animal is trained an emotional support animal has no training. So that's what really makes the difference. They're both serving a disability, a person with a disability. Let me clear that up. Um, I know there was a dog going around on, on social media that was supposed to be an um, emotional support animal for another dog that was blind. These laws only apply to humans. <laughs> so, um, and they only apply in the United States. These are federal laws. So, so um, the Air Carrier Act that, like airlines, for instance, they have different rules and regulations they follow if they fly out of the United States because they don't have to follow these rules. So dogs, you might see as most common type of assistance animal, but not always. There can be lots of other animals. So we've seen some pretty bizarre cases. Uh, there is someone in Pennsylvania that has a pet alligator. 
excuse me, not a pet, a, an emotional support animal alligator. Um, the challenge is, of course, that, um, you know, those are not real warm and cuddly. And so, uh, you know, you get to these exotic breeds that really cause some challenges. So HUD, who is who oversees the Fair Housing Act, um, HUD is the first one to get complaints or concerns. And then if um, after it goes through several levels of um, kind of review, if they feel that it could possibly be a violation, they turn it over to the Department of Justice. So again, it goes back to the Department of Justice. Those federal attorneys are the ones that prosecute and, and bring this forward and they, um, they're still the ones that ultimately that get everything. But with the, um, with the assistance animals, they had put out a ruling uh, a few months ago, and a ruling is not a change to the law, but a ruling is an interpretation of how to apply the law. And so what they said was they would not consider exotic breeds, um, especially dangerous exotic breeds, uh, to be an emotional support animal. So it needs to be a common type of domestic animal is what they recommended. So it could be a dog, could be a cat, could be a bird, it could be quite a few other things. Um, but hopefully we'll see those exotic ones kind of going away. So, so with fair housing, we also have two questions that we're allowed to ask to determine if the animal qualifies as an emotional support animal, which means we have to make that reasonable um, accommodation and change our policies and our rules. So the first question is, does the person seeking to use and live with the animal have a disability? So they they have to live in the property so i had a, a case recently where a grandmother owned the animal but didn't live there and just let the grandchild keep it well the person with a disability has to live with the animal to for the animal to be you know in use for the disability so the first question again it's a yes or no question does the person seeking to use and live with the animal have a disability Yes. If they answer yes, you go on to number two. Does the person making the request have a disability related need for an assistance animal? The word need is key there because lots of people have disabilities. It doesn't mean it creates a need for the assistance animal. So does the person making the request have a disability related need for an assistance animal? And these for lack of better terms are somewhat like prescribed by a doctor. And I'll talk about that in a moment. So um, that's who determines if the need is there basically as a professional. Uh, so those are the two questions we asked. Now, Fair Housing Act defers to ADA. So it says in the Fair Housing Act that we would always ask the two questions under the American with Disabilities Act first to determine if the animal is a service animal because that has precedence. If the animal is not a service animal, then we move on to the two questions under fair housing for the emotional support animals uh, to determine does the animal qualify there for us to make this reasonable accommodation. So if either of the questions, if the answer is no, then you're not required to modify if there's a no pets policy. However, if both answers are yes, then you're required under federal law to provide an exception and you must allow the pet. So you cannot charge additional rent for the pet because they're not considered a pet, they're considered an assistance animal. So because they have that federal protection, you don't charge extra money, you don't charge extra security deposit. What you are allowed to do is when the person moves out of the property, if you're renting it, and there is damage specifically from the emotional support animal, you are, or the service animal, you are allowed to charge for the damage as you would any other tenant with a pet. So, uh, you know, as long as you, you basically have to ignore that the animal's there. And as long as you treat them just like you do everybody else, then, uh, then you're okay. Now, these two questions, um, you're not allowed to ask individuals who have disabilities that are readily apparent. So if it's obvious, they come into your office, it's obvious they're in a wheelchair, they have a dog beside them, you assume that assistance animal is protected. So fair housing pulls in the service animal with the emotional support animal and blankets them under the assistance animals. So both, whether it's a service animal or whether it is an emotional support animal, if it's obvious, you do not ask any questions and you do not ask for documentation, okay? Or if it's known to the provider, in other words, if you know this person has a disability and you know they have the need for the animal, then you don't ask any questions about it either or documentation, okay? So you don't ask for any of that if it's obvious or you're aware of it.
So the documentation is always a big concern. There is no uniform documentation as to what it should look like or as to what it should say. So the challenge that comes along with the documentation is we get stuff all over the place, like just all kinds of um, different types of things. I've seen uh, what was a prescription. Basically, they wrote out on a prescription, an emotional support animal. I have seen them uh, write detailed letters on letterhead. Um, there's all kinds of different types of documentation that you'll get. And again, because of Fair Housing Act, we are allowed to ask for supporting documentation. Um, again, if it's not obvious or if we don't know about the disability. So it says in Fair Housing Act that it can be provided by a physician, a psychiatrist, a social worker, or other mental health professional. That's where it kind of gets vague, right? So an other mental health professional. I had someone ask me uh, in a class that uh, they had someone, a tenant who came to them applying to move into a property and they gave them a letter from their pastor uh, telling them that they should have emotional support animal, you know, that they were allowed to have an emotional support animal. So, you know, do pastors give counseling? Yeah, a lot of clergy, a lot of pastors and, and priests and whatnot give counseling. So could that be considered an other mental health professional? And so my answer was I'd probably allow them. And she said they had called their attorney and their attorney told them to allow the animal. So whenever you're in doubt, whenever you find yourself in a predicament or a specific circumstance, make sure that you reach out to your attorney and you get advice from them. Hopefully they have knowledge of the Fair Housing Act and knowledge of the ADA. Um, and you wanna make sure that they really kind of guide you in the right direction of that. Um, they cannot, one of the big trends that I'm seeing now uh, from homeowners and condo associations is they provide a letter that says the letter has to be filled out and signed by the doctor. They will not take any other type of documentation. HUD has said pretty clearly they think that that is not okay to do. So whatever documentation that the party gives you, the applicant, the tenant, the buyer, whoever, um, whatever that they give you, you basically need to go with it as long as it supports those questions and supports what they're telling you. So if um, I would say that I would verify the doctor just to make sure that it's not a fake letter that they printed from Google, which there are lots of them online. Um, and again, if they bought a letter online for, you know, $70 or $100 or whatnot, uh, those letters are not recognized under HUD or the Department of Justice. So the letter itself doesn't have any merit. If they hand you a letter, if they hand you documentation uh, from an online company where they bought this certificate, for lack of better terms, it doesn't mean that they're all fake. However, the requirement is in HUD's eyes that if a physician or a psychiatrist, social worker, other mental health professional is going to provide this letter, they needed to have a, a visit with them or some type of um, some type of consultation to determine that they actually had a disability and that they actually had the need for the emotional support animal. Now that can be videos, right? It, video conferencing with your doctor now is becoming very popular. Uh, so it doesn't mean that they have to meet face to face. However, it does mean they have to have a consultation. So they can't just go onto a website and pay the money and get a certificate. The doctor or mental health professional or whoever it is has to actually uh, kind of have a, 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 a visit with them, some type of a visit. So um, the documentation can kind of throw everybody off. But again, from the seller or the landlord's eyes, they have to allow the animal because they're protected under fair housing. Okay, so here's what you cannot do. You cannot charge a pet fee, you cannot charge higher rent, and you cannot deny them based on the animal. So if they come into your office, they have a 150 pound German Shepherd and you go, whoa, we don't allow those dogs. We don't allow dogs that big. You know, you can't have that, you know, where you're trying to move to. And if they say, well, it's an emotional support animal, or if they say it's a service animal, either one of those, what you're gonna do is go back through the two questions under ADA first, then you're gonna go to the two questions under emotional support animals if the animal does not qualify as a service animal if it's not trained. Then you move on to the emotional support animal. So they have to have a disability. They have to have the disability related need. And then uh, that triggers what type of animal if they need a trained animal, which would be a service animal or just an emotional support animal, which is there to provide them support emotionally. Um, 
so you don't want to deny them based off their disability. That's a huge problem. And there's lots of these cases on HUD's website of people that have screwed it up and done it wrong. So you don't want to be that. Um, and you may be charged, um, you can charge damages, as I mentioned, from the animal after vacating the property, not a moment sooner. Okay. So emotional support animals, as I mentioned, um, HUD oversees the complaints from the Fair Housing Act. It goes through four levels uh, before they determine if they feel it's a violation or could be a potential violation. And if it could be a potential violation, um, then they pass it forward to the Department of Justice and the Department of Justice prosecutes. Okay. Now I have a feeling, I know this is a, a hot topic, so I think we're probably going to have quite a few questions. Uh, so at this point, if we have any questions, go ahead and um, go ahead and share those and I'll be glad to answer whatever I can. Yeah. Thank you, Cynthia. Um, let's see, we have a couple of questions. Some of the ones entered in um, were answered throughout the webinar process um, presentation. But the first one that hasn't been answered is, would a service animal always accompany the disabled person or may the dog be left at the home? That's a great question. And that's an interesting question, which is a little bit different for us as um, housing providers. So in a typical ADA response under the American with Disabilities Act, if they have a service animal, the service animal should be with them at all times. Now I say that with a caveat because for housing, it's a little bit different. So let's say that, um, you know, when you think about a person going out in public, um, if they're staying at a hotel, for instance, which is not considered public housing uh, per se, that's, you know, uh, that's temporary housing. So if they go to a hotel, they're not allowed to leave the animal in the hotel room when they're not present. So they have to take the animal with them at all times. However, when it comes to their full-time housing, where they live all the time, the majority, their housing, their main housing, let's say that the person had the service animal because they got seizures, they had seizures. And so if they had a seizure, the dog knew how to turn them over and, and, you know, go get help and so on. Now let's say that this person is on a Saturday going to go out to lunch with a family member and the family member, let's say it's like their sister or brother or somebody very close to them. So could that human, could that person take the place of what the animal is trained to do? In other words, yes, that person could, handle them in, in the case of a seizure, get, you know, call 911, things like that. So in that case, we might find in our housing that they do leave the animal at home and the emotional support animal always is left at home, unless if they're allowing pets, like some restaurants do allow you to bring a pet and sit outside or whatnot, that's okay, but they're not required to allow you to do that. So the emotional support animal is almost always left at home. The service animal goes with them probably the majority of time. Okay, the next question is, what if a potential buyer has a support animal and the realtor or seller has a severe allergy to dog dander or a disabling phobia of animals? How can the showings be performed and can you ask that no animals be allowed into the home? So another great question. You guys have great questions. Um, I actually met with HUD last May at the NAR meetings um, to talk about what we were hoping to get some of these new clarifications and rulings that they came out with. And the topic of allergies came up because that is a concern for sellers who or landlords that you know don't want a cat in their house because they have severe cat allergies. And then you've got somebody that moves in or even during the tenancy have the ability to then go get an emotional support animal. So sometimes it happens during the process as well when they're already there. So the challenge that comes up with that is when um, you've got a seller who has these allergies and they don't want the animal, what HUD said directly was they do not have any knowledge of an allergy coming to the level of being so severe that it would override another disability. So basically they looked at it to say, which is the lesser of the two evils, I guess you could say. And so the allergy uh, was less important to them than the disability of the person who had the need and the doctor or whoever felt, you know, the, the uh, health professional felt that it was important for them to have the service animal or the emotional support animal. So in a nutshell, they basically said they don't care about allergies. Um, they, you know, that that is just, some of the joy of being a landlord is um, that they don't care about allergies. So basically the allergy is not an excuse uh, for them to deny the animal or deny the person. Again, they treat the animal just like a wheelchair. So if it's there for the need for the disability, 
even on the emotional side of it, it's there to assist the person with a disability, you really have to act like the animal doesn't exist, which is very difficult, I know, for some of us, and especially for our landlords. Let me throw one more caveat in with that. The applicant or tenant or buyer never has to tell you or anybody, the landlord, anybody, that they have one of these animals. So again, think about the fact that they um, they don't come into your, they, you know, they don't call you on the phone and say, hey, I'm looking to rent a property. And by the way, I have a wheelchair. It's just not something that they're required to disclose. So because of that, they're not required under any obligation to disclose. But what typically happens is they read the bylaws or they read the rules of the association or they fill out the application to live in a property for a rental and it says, do you have any pets? And that's where they'll kind of put down those uh, questions and answers of yes, but then all of a sudden it's an emotional support animal. So they don't have to tell you. However, you know, sometimes they do. Many times I think they do. And that's where you're going to go back and ask those questions. If a tenant moves in partway through the process, uh, or if they're already moved in and partway through the process, let's say the tenant has already lived in the unit for six months, and now all of a sudden you notice that there's a dog at the property and they're not allowed to have pets, then you would serve your, you know, you would post your notice, whatever's required for you to do that, and notify them that they're not allowed to have the animal, then they would notify you that the animal either is a service animal or an emotional support animal. At that time, when they notify you of that, then you trigger in and ask the question. So you're gonna start out with the two questions under ADA, and you're gonna ask those to determine if it's a service animal, and if it's not, then you move on to the two questions under the Fair Housing Act to determine if the animal is an emotional support animal and protected under the Fair Housing Act. So it's not always at the beginning of the process that we're working with people and they tell us they have these. Now. In the question they had asked, what about a seller who's showing their property as well? This is very challenging and most sellers don't like this answer. However, once a seller puts their property on the market, even a for sale by owner, they open their property up to the public once they advertise it anywhere. And at that point, all of these laws apply to them. So in other words, they have to allow the animal even for showings. However, that makes it, that, especially if you're the buyer's agent, puts you in a very difficult situation. What I would recommend is if you're working with a buyer and they're asking, you know, they have an animal, you know that they have an emotional support animal or you know that they have a service animal, ask them if they will be bringing the animal with them. Now, the emotional support animal does not have to go with them on showings. It's ADA that kicks in. So the service animal is protected and can go with them on showings. So ask them if it's okay to, you know, talk to that, uh, talk about that with the listing agent and make sure that they're okay with it. The seller really cannot deny them into the property, but giving them a heads up sure eliminates some challenges, I think, down the road with arguments or problems or, you know, they see on their camera that someone came by and had a huge dog with them and they get all upset. But you really need to have the buyer's permission because basically you're disclosing the fact that they have this animal and that it's a disability. There's a disability related there. And so you need to make sure your buyer's on the same page with you about that. Any more questions? Um, there's one more that we have time for that piggybacks on that um, question. It's, is it okay for leasing companies to ask them to carry renter's insurance if the dog is the various type that is listed as a liability dog with insurance companies? Okay, good question, yeah. So, you know, a lot of times that does happen where we want the tenant or the landlord wants the tenant to uh, get renter's insurance. So if they are requiring them to get renter's insurance for their personal belongings, if they require all the tenants to do that, the landlord can still continue to require all the tenants to get renter's insurance. But when it comes to adding the pet on and getting a pet policy on the renter's insurance, they're not allowed to ask for the animal to get any type of insurance. In other words, again, they really have to act like the animal doesn't exist. Now, I will tell you on the service animal side of things, um, a, a, I hate to call them a real service animal, but a real service animal goes through uh, anywhere from 18 months to two and a half years of extensive training. They DNA test these dogs when they're born because they don't wanna put in all the training and time if the animal has some kind of defect or it's not gonna live a full life. So they go through a ton of breeding um, DNA backgrounds and history. Uh, they they uh, definitely take care of these animals with shots and records and all of that stuff with you know great food and, and whatnot. They're not feeding them the cheap food, all that type of stuff. 
So the cost of a service animal can range anywhere from $45,000 to over $100,000 because it takes two full years of extensive training plus. These, um, when a person receives a service animal through a, there's a ton of different entities out there that offer this, but um, basically what they most of the time require is the handler to then come and stay on site at the training facility for about a two week period roughly so that they can learn how to handle the dog, the you know the the um, training commands and all of that stuff, and so the two of them can kind of bond and work together. In addition to that, what they learn during that two-week training period is they learn all about the ADA laws and the do's and the don'ts, and they understand and know their rights. So typically, the person with a service animal knows and understands what the rules are and what the rules aren't. Um, but the other people, I think, because we do get so many fakes, I think most of the time it's with the emotional support animals. So I think by knowing the proper questions that we're allowed to ask and then knowing how to handle that. So we start out with the two questions under ADA, then we go to the two questions under the Fair Housing Act. And then um, if, they, if they're not aware of the laws and they don't know, or it's not a real animal that's protected, I guess we'll say, at that point, I think it stumps them and throws them off. So, you know, I had somebody that applied years ago that had three pit bulls. They were applying for a rental. And uh, when I started asking the questions and then for verification of documentation, I never heard from her again. So I think sometimes it weeds out by, by knowing the knowledge and the questions that we can ask, it can weed out some of the um, people who don't know, they're fakes, they just bought a certificate online, whatever, they just thought they could bring their dog with them everywhere, or their animal, and it wouldn't be a problem. So I think that knowing those questions is really the big key thing. Do we have any other questions? I think we have time for a couple more. Um, this one is, what if an SA or ESA is causing damage or disturbing other tenants? Is that cause for eviction or can I request that an ESA be removed? So depending, uh, another good question, depending on what the animal is specifically doing. So um, again, in the situation where they cause damage to the unit, um, that would be charged to the tenant as part of like the claim process at the end. So they can charge them for the damage after they've moved out and kind of released the property back over to the uh, landlord or the property manager. So the damage definitely you can charge for, but not until the very end with the same with emotional support animal as with a service animal. If the animal is causing a lot of disruption, let's say that you have um, an apartment complex that you're managing and they have a very loud animal that's barking like crazy or a bird that's chirping and it's not under control, uh, you can ask them to try to maintain, they still have to maintain um, reasonable, um, there's a term for, and I, I'm sorry, I forgot it, HUD calls it, but basically they, they still have to have the dog, the animal under control. So, you know, it doesn't give them a free pass to just do whatever they want and act however they want and so on. So if they're disturbing the peace, if the animal is aggressive towards other people, things like that, yes, there is the ability to ask them to remove the animal. Now, in the other instance that this happens, let's say that they move into a unit and the unit right beside them has had a tenant already in it for a year and a half. And that tenant is highly allergic to cats. And your newer tenant now brings in an emotional support animal that's a cat. And your existing tenant is sneezing and complaining that it's coming through the walls and they are just you know, complaining consistently about the animal. You cannot, ask the person with the emotional support animal to leave or move. What you can do is offer the ability, if, if it's feasible and if you can do this, offer the ability for the existing tenant to relocate or move elsewhere. So that, that's the same thing that goes on airplanes and whatnot. The person with a disability, if someone comes and sits beside me and has a service animal, a dog, let's say, and I'm allergic to dogs, I cannot ask the flight attendant to move the person with the dog because it's a service animal. I can ask the flight attendant to relocate me to a new seat. Um, so in other words, the person with a disability is protected. It's everybody else that kind of has to move out of the way or figure out how to handle that. Okay, I think that wraps up the questions. Did you have any wrap up comments? I do actually, this is a lot of information. I'm very aware of that. And again, I told you, you didn't have to write down the questions. If you're interested and you want a 58 page ebook 
all on service animals and emotional support animals. There's direct quotes out of both of those laws in there. And again, you have the questions from both ADA and the emotional support, and uh, I'm sorry, ADA and Fair Housing Act for the emotional support animals. If you wanted to do that, you can go to my website and download this ebook for free. Do not pay for it because you're gonna enter in the coupon code that you see on the screen SC webinar, South Carolina webinar. So um, make sure that you put in that coupon code and it's free for you to download that ebook. And that'll give you written support that you can keep so that, you know, in a couple of months, if something comes up and you need to go back and refer to those questions, you have them, you have them available and it can keep you out of trouble because we definitely don't want to be any of those, um, any of those case studies uh, where people have gotten themselves in trouble. So that's it. I hope this has helped. Thank you, Cynthia. We appreciate you being here with us today. And thank you all for joining today's webinar. And this concludes the webinar. Thank you.